Good morning, everyone, and happy Monday. Um, I am Sam here with NATP, and I have joined uh, or I have joining me. I have Tom Osaban. Tom is our incredible director of tax content and government relations. Tom, um, you are just doing wonderful things, um, helping you know our staff and members really focus on what is relevant and, and prepare for tax season. So thanks for being here with me today. Um, it's always a pleasure. It. Yeah. So we are talking today um, specifically, we're, we're doing something a little bit different. Usually we focus on um, tax preparers, but today we're focusing on the clients. So tax payers. Um, and we wanted to give some tips for either, any taxpayers watching this, but also for um, members who are, you know, having conversations with their clients around this time of year, things that they can do to end the year on a high note. Um, and so we're, we're talking really about tips for taxpayers to end 2022 on a high note. Um, Tom, anything you want to add before we get started? Any, any recap of 2022 that um, you thought was, would be interesting? Any, I guess, what are the biggest, you know, headlines that you thought? Well, there's been a number of things, Sam. We haven't had any real, real major legislation, but we, we've had some some things that have happened that are dealing with perhaps we can talk about energy credits. Maybe I'll start right there. You know, to to our folks that may be contemplating as the weather's changing, you're in, you're in a certain area of the country now that you know all of a sudden it seems like we're popping from fall back to summer, back to winter, and and you're thinking about that. Uh, we used to have for homeowners that $500 lifetime credit for getting a new high efficiency furnace or a new water heater or do insulation projects or all of that. That's really going to improve next year, thanks to what was called the Inflation Reduction Act, IRA for short, bad acronym because we get confused with a retirement plan. But starting next year, 2023, the it's going to be a $1,200 limit for these types of improvements. There's numbers within those, but it's going to be an annual limit. So if you're contemplating, I'll, I'll tell you folks, you're contemplating right now about replacing that furnace, maybe replacing your windows. You may turn that window project into a multi-year uh, process. So rather than use up that once in a lifetime uh, use, which goes all the way back to like 2005, that was the thing you really had to track. If you're contemplating some big energy saving improvement, you might want to wait till next year or just do a little bit of it this year. That's probably a big takeaway in this, in this energy efficient type atmosphere. And this is supposed to go on to like 2032. Oh, wow. You know, so by is, next year, to clarify, Tom, you mean starting January 1, 2023. That's Correct. exactly what I mean, okay. Sam. You're hitting the nail right on the head. Perfect. And also too, if people are contemplating the purchase of electric vehicles, again, the credits are going to be better starting next year. And as it is, here we are, you know, Early, early November, I think if you ordered a vehicle today, you wouldn't get it before the end of the year anyway. But there's going to be some, there's going to be some income limits. And interestingly enough, Sam, the, the, uh, the Congress was thinking ahead a little bit. If you go out to, say, 2024, in that, in that Inflation Reduction Act that I'm talking about, mm -hmm. they're trying to, to create a circumstance where you would actually get your tax credit when you buy the vehicle. So it would happen at the wow. dealership. And it's going to include used vehicles. Now, the credit for the used vehicles will start next year as well. But it, but going out about a year and a half could be a circumstance. And I don't know how they're going to have the dealerships, uh, you know, manage the idea of how much money you make because there are income phase outs and only certain vehicles will qualify. But interestingly, interestingly enough, to take that tax credit away from being a part of your tax return to actually being something you would get. And it'd be much more effective if you think about it to get it when we purchase the vehicle. So those are a couple of a couple of big changes that are coming out of the, those rules from a new a new law that was signed by President Biden just a couple of months ago. You know, you know, dealing with that. Okay. So would you say maybe that is kind of one of the biggest headlines that um, ta that affects taxpayers in this past year, twenty twenty two, was the IRA? The I would program. I would say that's one of them. And there's okay. a, there's a second there's a second piece if I can. Go ahead, yes, go ahead please. with that. So people might remember that when they filed their 21 taxes, we had the results of the American Rescue Plan, again, signed by President President Biden. Tax professionals will realize that this happened during filing season because we remember it happening in March. No fault to the president, just you know when it, when it became law. We saw a great expansion in the child tax credits and also mm -hmm. 
in basically, for lack of a better term, the daycare credit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, those provisions were one year only. So when, when people are here now in 2022 and they're coming up to the end of the year, they're going to see one, they didn't get any advanced child tax credit payments during the course of 2022. So we didn't have that money coming out early. So we're going back to what the rules were before 2021. The same thing with the daycare credit. The daycare credit is going back to what it was before. So right now in, in November, in fact, we just had our announcement at our own firm, Sam, that it's open enrollment season. Mm -hmm. So a couple of things that people might be thinking about if they're planning to fund their flexible spending accounts for next year, for 2023, two thoughts in, in, in this area. One being, if you've got dollars in those flex savings accounts, mm -hmm. get your doctor's appointments scheduled because those are the use it or lose it accounts. Now you can carry over like $570 or something like that. And I think you can submit expenses all the way up to like March, but don't, don't leave money on the table. So, and while you're, while you're doing that, maybe uh, booking those dentist appointments. I know a good friend of mine is a dentist and uh, I invited him to go to a hockey game one time, like the last week of the year. And he goes, this is the busiest week of the year because everybody's <laughs> coming in to get those flex spending dollars spent. So two things happening. One, you're, you're spending those flex savings dollars, get the, get the appointment scheduled before the end of the year. And then that should also impact your decision making for what you want to put aside for 2023. Mm -hmm. And within that flex savings is also the dependent care credit. Some people would do, the maximum you can do is $5,000 per family. Doing that in a pre-tax basis in that flex spending account to reimburse you for those daycare expenses. 2021 was a little bit of anomaly because the credit that was being offered was so good that maybe flex spending wasn't as good. But going back now, I think flex spending, unless there's a law change again, which can always happen, that flex spending is probably a little better way to, to save tax dollars. So flex spending is now for one more thing. And for HSAs, those of you who have HSA qualified high deductible health plans, the money that you put into the HSA to cover what the insurance doesn't pay, that is not a use it or lose it account. In fact, for many people, that's becoming the equivalent of an IRA because you can leave that money aside, it grows tax deferred. When you take it out at retirement age, and retirement age for one of those plans is age 65, mm -hmm. instead of 59 and a half like an IRA, you'll pay tax on it then, but you mm -hmm. save tax up, up front or you could use it to pay qualified medical expenses and it would still be tax free. So those FSAs, Frank, Sam, Apple, and HSAs, Henry, Sam, Apple accounts, this is open enrollment time. It's time to think about those issues. For next year. Interesting. That's a really good point to um, planning right now. Is there, you know, looking back, we, you talked a little bit about um, the child tax credit changes. Um, so that was kind of a big, could have been a challenge that some tax payers faced this year specifically as compared to last, or I'm sorry, 2021. Um, are there any other challenges that you can think of that, you know, taxpayers faced this past year? Well, here, here's one to think about. And this, this takes a little bit of going back a little, a little farther back in 2020. So we're in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. People may have been forced to take distributions from qualified retirement plans because they were somehow impacted by COVID. Maybe they weren't sick, but they could have had work reduction or, or other types of issues, um, all, all of that. Well, so they had an option of either claiming that distribution mm -hmm. all in 2020, or they could spread it out for three years. Well, that would have, that'll end now with the 2022 filing if you did it 20, 21, 22, I'm counting on my fingers. But here's a wrinkle to it. If your economic situation perhaps improved, you have three years to put the money back. Huh. So let's say, for example, someone took a distribution, I'll just use the date, October 1st, 2020. Mm -hmm. The three-year clock began ticking the next day. Mm. So you have really, if you think about it, you, you had have until October 2nd, 2023 to put some or all of that money back. And then you know what you can do? You could go back and amend the return where you claim the income, get some tax dollars back for yourself. So that's something to think about if you've come into a windfall, maybe an inheritance or 
uh, a bonus at work or something like that, and you're wondering what to do with it, would it make sense to pay down on the house or would it make sense to put the money back into a qualified plan? So that could be a possibility as well. Something, something to think about, but you're right. Um, we don't have, we don't have recovery rebates to have to reconcile mm -hmm. this year. We don't have those advanced child tax credits. Although I'll tell you, I, I don't remember the exact statistic, but the IRS uh, posted something on their newsroom just a couple of weeks ago. And there's some huge amount of money in the area of the child tax credits that hasn't been claimed. Hmm. And if for some reason, this is a revelation to you folks who are paying attention this morning, who've tuned in with us, that I believe you have until November 30th to file a claim to get that child tax credit that maybe you didn't get wow. under the American Rescue Plan before you would before you would lose it. So that's a thought process too. If there's people that say, oh, wait a minute, I have younger children. I don't recall getting anything, getting anything like that. It might be worth checking out or talking with a tax professional. Definitely. Yeah. And um just to you know reiterate, of course, if you're a taxpayer and you are not working with a tax professional at this point, um, you know, they would be able to help you with all of these things that you're talking about. So, you know, put tax planning, um, distributions, um, perhaps putting off, you know, mm -hmm. those big mm -hmm. home improvement um, plans. Those could be something that a taxpayer could talk through with their tax professional to get the best financial outcome. Absolutely. There's another point, if I can, if I can throw it in, yeah, uh, please. Sam, we, we had what, what was called the SECURE Act back in 2000 or in the end of 2019 that dealt with retirement plans. Well, there was a provision in there that let, let's say you are the beneficiary of an IRA who's not your spouse and you're not a minor child. Mm -hmm. So the rule used to be that you could take out a lump sum or you could take the money out over five years or you could take it out at the same rate that the person who passed away was taking it out. Well, the SECURE Act, the language of it looked like that number one, you can't do the lifetime distribution anymore. That was called a stretch IRA that you could stretch it out. But what the SECURE Act said is beneficiaries who aren't spouses or qualified or what they call eligible designated beneficiaries, throw it, hate to throw tax lingo at you, but that's tax lingo, um, said that you could take it out over 10 years and you could actually wait until the 10th year to take the money out. Well, the IRS has proposed regulations coming out right now. And they are saying that, no, there has to be a distribution every year for that kind of a beneficiary. And they are not going to penalize people for not doing this in 2020, uh, 2021 or 2022. But starting in 2023, they will be required to take some money on. You think about it, it'd be roughly 10 percent, wouldn't it? If you spread something out over 10 years, it'd be about 10 percent a year. So there won't be a penalty. You don't have to go back and take distributions. But going forward, you're not going to be able to wait until that 10th year. You'll have to take something out each year. So that's a proposed regulation right now. Normally, what the IRS does is they have a period where people can comment mm -hmm. and then they take those comments and then they decide if the regulations are going to become final. If I was a betting person, I would almost guarantee these proposed regulations will become final. So mm -hmm. that's something to watch, too. If you're planning, you're working with your financial planner. I just had a meeting with a, a couple this past weekend. Their investment advisor already told them that because they're the kind of people that would have to do it. So I'm really, I'm really proud of the investment world that they're they're uh, they're aware of this proposed regulation out there because that that gets into the planning uh, mm -hmm. of impacting people's income. So that's another one to watch for those required minimum distributions. Um, and you know, talking about required minimum distributions, I'm sorry, Sam, I'm not letting you get a question in edgewise. No, that's quite Don't all right. For you folks who are you know, maybe you were already 70 and a half, you were already taking required minimum distributions or, you know, the SECURE Act raised that to age 72. You know, the RMDs need to be done by the end of the year. So if you've got qualified plans, qualified IRAs, you need to make those required minimum distributions, get those done before the end of the year. You're facing a 50% penalty if you, you know, if you don't take the money out, or you don't take out enough on what you should have taken so be careful with those two. There's only one year. And in fact, I've had a couple of clients reach out to me over the course of the year who said, wow, I don't see where I took money out of my IRA back in 2020. Am I in trouble? That year, the rule was vacated because of COVID, hmm. but not since. So 2022, you're in that age group that needs to take an RMD, do it before the end of the year. There are a lot of rules 
Um, rule changes yes, to sure remember are. this year. <laughs> a lot of things that went back and back and forth, and it's really important to stay on top of that, definitely. Um, so talking, Tom, for the last you know two months of the year, um, I want to talk a little bit about what taxpayers can do now that while there's still time to set themselves up um, for you know the best possible tax situation um, when it comes time to do their returns, their 2022 returns. Can you give us some advice? Do you have any tips um, and tricks, you know, any anything that people should be doing now? Well, you certainly can imagine that I do. <laughs> so, you know, you still have, let's say you're an employee, you still have several paychecks left this year. It might not be a bad idea. Take a look at a pay stub, maybe compare things to last year and do a little bit of an early projection of what your tax outcome might be. You still have, like I said, a few paychecks that maybe you could adjust your withholding up or down. Maybe you can have more money in your pocket if it looks like, well, we're going to come out pretty good this year. Maybe I don't have to have as much money going in for withholding at you know the most expensive time of the year, gift giving and all, all of that. Mm -hmm. So looking at your withholding so you're not surprised come tax season. I'm sorry, tax filing time. So that would be one thing. You adjust your withholding up, up or down. If your company allows for it, you know, put more money into that retirement plan. Even if you're doing it after tax, say in a, in a 401k Roth, for example, putting the money away makes sense because someday we're not going to be able to work anymore, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're trying to save taxes, then that traditional 401k, that money's got to go in out of your paycheck. So you could make some adjustment. Maybe you're facing a year-end bonus. <laughs> some more, put some more money in. I think the dogs agree. How about that? Yeah. So... That would be that would be one thing to consider. Consider your withholding. How about if you're self-employed? What what's your year been like? Well, that's kind of like talk talk about talk about the pets. That's kind of trying to grab a dog by its tail and that trying to figure out what the income and expense for the year is going to be. This would be a time to evaluate that. Again, just did this with a client on Saturday. What's the year going to look like? What do we need to do for maybe a fourth quarter estimate estimated tax payment? you know, coming up, which would be due in January, but still counts for the previous year. Also in that same same area, if you're self-employed, the idea of buying equipment. Do you want to, do you need equipment in your business? Would it make sense to make that investment before the end of the year? It doesn't have to be paid for. The terminology that the IRS is, is used is placed into service. You know what that means? Simply, you're using it. It's not sitting in a box over in a corner or, or worse, you didn't place an order and it's not going to be delivered till March. That certainly is not placed in the service. Finally, the market's been really, really volatile this year. The stock market has. You might be surprised that you have gains because, for example, if you're in mutual funds, you've got money managers that are doing that gyration every day, that buying and selling, buying and selling. You might have gains. Would it make sense to talk to that investment advisor and say, hey, what's the picture look like for this year? Do I have some loser positions that I could perhaps sell and offset the gains? That might make sense. Conversely, you want to look at things in a global picture. You know, capital gains, Sam, can be as low as 0%. Hmm. Would it make sense to pay the tax on those gains if the tax hit's not going to be too bad? So finally, there's an old tried and true. It's a little bit more difficult now with standard deductions the way they are. One old piece of advice is clean out your closets. And I'm going to date myself, and the older people like this. I'm not going to get back into those Sergio Valente jeans that I bought way back when anyway. Why don't I go ahead and give those to Goodwill, make some more room in my closet, right? So clean out your closets, give the stuff to Goodwill, get a receipt. You can use basically yard sale values. And maybe you're in a situation where you have enough to itemize deductions. Hey, then that'll be another deduction. And all you did was, was clear out some space in, in, your, in your closet. So those charitable contributions before the end of the year, I remember a long time ago, somebody said, what's that date in January that I can make a charitable contribution and still take it off last year's taxes? My answer is December 31st. <laughs> yeah. and, I, and, I, and I get what the person was asking because sometimes, you know, the IRS has been reactive to perhaps, I'm, I'm thinking of the, the hurricane that hit Haiti the one year. Right at the end of the year, the IRS said contributions made to like January 15th could be counted, you know, last year. But that that's that's an outlier. You know, in, in typical circumstances, you got to write that check by December the 31st. Sure. 
Now, there is one other um, date in November that is important for people to remember if they're e-filing. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? That's right. And I think it is. I didn't write it down, Sam, but I think it's November November 26th. That sounds is that, right. Yeah, I, I, can... I think that's the date. <laughs> what, what, what happens is after that date, what and I'm, and I'm really dating myself in saying this, that's when I say the IRS does retooling. In other words, they shut down the ability to submit a return electronically as they get themselves set up for the next filing season, which typically happens around Dr. King's birthday in January is about when the new year opens up. Now, all that means is, does it mean you can't submit a return anymore? No, it just means you can't submit one electronically. So if you haven't filed your 2021 return, for example, yet, you want to maybe get that done before the end of the month or wait and do it in January, because I would strongly suggest if you can, folks, avoid mailing in returns. The backlog of the IRS is still enormous. Many, 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 many months. I'm just now having clients who filed amended returns back in March are starting to hear from the IRS now. And it's things are kind of, they're not good is all I can say that yeah. they're, they're overwhelmed. So for some reason you say, well, for whatever reason, I'm not going to be ready to file that return until December. I'd say wait till the third week of January and let, mm -hmm. let's have you file it electronically so that it doesn't add to that backlog and you're not waiting six, eight, nine, maybe even a full year for that return to be processed when it was submitted in paper. So the IRS is, is hiring more staff, you know, like anything else, that staff's got to be trained. Mm -hmm. And in yeah. getting people trained and up to speed is going to take time. So that would be my advice. But yeah, that's an important day. Very much so, Sam. So those personal returns, the, the mod e-file system, as they call it, will shut down, I believe, on November 26th. And then you'll have to wait until the third week of January before returns can be submitted electronically once again. Awesome. That is a huge amount of information, Tom. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, I think there are some really good gems in there for people to remember and, and pick out. Um, and, you know, overall, again, we always reiterate, if you have questions, um, talk with a, a tax professional, talk with someone who does this for a living. Um, they, they know the ins and outs and, you know, the rules better than anyone. So is there anything else you want to add, Tom, before we wrap up today? I was just going to tack right on to what you said, Sam. This is yeah. the, this is a time of the year when your your tax professional is beginning to think about the next year. Uh, they just got through the extension deadlines in October. It, it's probably a good time to reach out to your tax professional and say, "Hey, I'd like to do a you know a quick and dirty analysis of what what we could do before the end of the year." Because when you you know you meet with them in February or March you always find yourself in a situation where well, I've got some great ideas for next year. Mm -hmm. So why not be proactive instead of reactive and reach out to that tax professional now and be an informed taxpayer. And that's going to, that's going to make you better understand your taxes and you're reaching out to your professional at a time of year when they've got some more time to give you the attention you deserve. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, that is all that I have today, Tom, unless there's any other final parting words that you, you want to add. I hope everybody has peaceful and relaxful holidays. Oh, that's, that's so nice. Me too. Ditto. <laughs> well, thanks again for joining me, Tom. I really appreciate it. Um, for anyone who's watching, please, uh, if you like, subscribe to our page. Um, you will get notified next time we go live. So please do that. Um, if you have any questions or are looking to find a tax professional, um, our all of our NATP members are listed at nataptax.com. And we also, one last plug, have our virtual tax season updates coming up if you are a tax preparer um, looking for updates for the 20. 23 tax filing season for 2022 returns. Did I say that right, Tom? You sure did. Okay, perfect. Sounds good. <laughs> so um, again, lots of information we covered today. This will be, um, well, you know, you can re replay this um, as many times as you'd like, but thanks again, Tom, for joining me. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Everyone too. Thanks for Very joining good. us today. Thanks.